Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Richard E. Wagner, the Holbert L. Harris Professor of Economics at George Mason University. His new book is Politics as a Peculiar Business, Insight from a Theory of Entangled Political Economy. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Dr. Wagner. Well, thank you for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. I often start by asking uh, authors uh, a question about the title, but your title is very, very mixed up with the background within your writing, uh, the background of Virginia political economy and just classical economics. So before we get to what a peculiar business is or even a theory of entangled political economy, maybe we can sort of set the scene with the prior literature as you do in the book and just start off talking about public choice in the Virginia school and what that is and how that's a background to what your book is adding to it. Well, this book is a continuation of lines of thought I've been developing probably for about 15 years uh, where I came to realize that so much theory in economics and political economy has a government as an entity that is apart from and stands outside of what we call a market economy and intervenes into it. And so it's like a mechanic. If an economy is like an engine or a machine, a government is like a mechanic. And so it comes in and repairs and keeps the machine working. In contrast, I have been working with the idea that an economy is nothing like a machine. It's rather like a, oh, a, a coral reef or a tropical rainforest, a rich an ecology of different kinds of entities, or to use an image I've used in a number of cases, including in this book, is that the standard economic theory analogizes a society to a parade. You know, a parade can have 5,000 members. But you can take that parade and reduce it to a little point on a map and watch it as it goes along. In contrast, I analogize a society to a crowd of pedestrians, maybe 100,000 people spilling out of a stadium after a game, where you would not begin to think of that as like a parade. Now, someone might say it's an unruly parade and needs to be tamed, and that's where policy might come in, but if you think about it, it's, it's, it's a social process that works well. People all get to their destinations pretty much as they plan, but th what accounts for the order of the pedestrian crowd has nothing to do with what accounts for the order of the parade. For the parade, the order was based upon the marching abilities of the band members, the uh, uh, organizational abilities of the conductor and so forth, whereas for the pedestrian crowd, it's based on such things as recognizing that we're not like bumper cars. We don't like to really collide into other people and we have ways of recognizing where people are heading how to, and in turn how to increase or decrease our speed and so you can have people going every which way and it all works and so that Schema thought has been with me for a good 15 years and trying to lay this out in a variety of books and articles now. Well, you have an interesting line because uh, you put it in the context of the Virginia School as I mentioned and you, the Adam Smith, Carl Minger line of thinking but kind of going to the parade crowd analogy of a line where you say uh, that the distinction between different types of economists is based on the accounts different economists give for the observed orderly, orderliness of societies, which seems to be some economists seem to think it's more like a parade and that the government – and then you have the entanglement part. The government is – can come in and just direct it and they're separate. They're separate entities but that's wrong if you would say. And like Samuelson kind of situation. No, I do think it's a wrong-headed way of conceiving of economies and societies. Uh, and also is, governments, though, well, as governments yeah, too. As, as governments, as as part of that, and that's you know, I I think of governments as existing within societies, just as businesses do. That's the idea of of government as a peculiar business. Is it is a business that people. You know, invest in politicians and political parties. People earn their livelihoods in political parties. Candidates advertise 
all over the place that uh, uh, it has many of the features of business, but it's a peculiar one because you really can't have any kind of market test for the claims that political candidates make. Just out of curiosity, why is the, the origin of the term Virginia school? Um, why is the Virginia school called the Virginia school? That is a term that was first used in – I think it was 1961. Could have been 60 or 62 but I believe it was 61 where University of Virginia had assembled an extraordinary bunch of economists of James Buchanan, Ronald Coase, uh, Warren Nutter, Gordon Tullock and so forth and had a very distinctive approach to economics and political economy, a much more of an integrated approach to political economy. In fact, what was uh, – later became called the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Political Economy was originally called the Thomas Jefferson Center for the Study of Political Economy and Social Philosophy. And there were people in the university administration who – dislike the highly classical liberal thrust that uh, those people had and they uh, attained a consultant's report on the Department of Economics that started off – said that – like quoting basically from memory, not accurately, but basically that this department is composed of a large number of unusually gifted and creative people. But at the same time, the program is way outside the mainstream of economics and it really should be brought back into the mainstream. And so uh, – and because in, in that report, it used that there is a distinctive Virginia school of political economy taking shape here. And so in, in, in result of that report, uh, we had things like the university wouldn't match an offer to Ronald Coase from the University of Chicago. It uh, wouldn't promote Gordon Tullock uh, who left the University of Buchanan left and the whole uh, Virginia uh, tradition that was taking shape there with a different approach to political economy uh, kind of exploded. Some of it regrouped in uh, – Blacksburg has now moved to Fairfax and the tradition is, has kept alive and I think is growing. And what's, and what's distinct about in, – in because I think sometimes I hear people call – we just talk about public choice theory. They, what they call it the Chicago theory about or the different kind of public choice about Arrow's theorem and things like this. What's distinct about the Virginia school? What's distinctive is how you do economics or how you think of economics. A very shorthand expression or definition of public choice is public choice is the application of economics to politics. Well and good. But that still raises the question, well, what kind of economics? Because there's different styles of doing economics, each of which will lead to a different way of trying to bring politics into the uh, rubric of economic theory. The most common form of economic theory still and has been for a, a good century has been based upon notions of economic observations pertain to a system that's in a state of equilibrium. And that scheme of thought, if you think about it, I think leads almost automatically to thinking of some outside observer as a mechanic who can then shift an economy from one state to another. Whereas within the Virginia tradition and which goes back I think much more to classical economic modes of thinking like Adam Smith sees a society as a continual ongoing development process that really isn't adequately characterized by notions of equilibrium but rather is more fully uh, concerned with how it is that a set of people who are occupying a relatively contained geographical space can develop institutional procedures, practices, cr traditions and so forth that allow each of them to have a good amount of liberty to govern themselves to determine their own affairs and yet recognize that we all do live in close geographical proximity and so there has to be uh, these there, – there is a 
inherent collective or political element to the uh, to the living together. So if you ask the man on the street what economics is or what it would mean to talk about the economics of something, they'll a lot of them will tend to say it has something to do with money changing hands and goods and services being bought and sold and business companies, the stock market maybe. So for those people, what would it it might sound confusing to say we should apply economic thinking to government because government doesn't have those things. You know, these people aren't the they're not earning money in the traditional sense by selling a product. Their salaries are fixed by law. Um, and they're not they're not buying and selling things, um, and they're they're intervening in that sort of stuff. But they look distinct from it. So when we when we talk about thinking about the state economically, is this a do we have to think about economics differently than that kind of man on the street view, or how do we apply this? Yes, there are two different ways in which economists have approached what economics is. Uh, one way is defined in terms of subject matter. So economics is the science that studies the practice of business. That's a very common, very conventional uh, study. Uh, another uh, definition of economics is that economics isn't the study of a class of activity but as the study of the entire range of human activity that pertains to intentional action. And so you could say as a basic principle that people in whatever they undertake to do intentionally seek to do it better rather than poorer, seek to be successful rather than seek to fail. And that kind of principle of economizing action where all actions we face choices uh, where we accept and do some things, reject other things, that that kind of economizing principle at work can be brought to bear on just practically everything. And the challenge then for economic thinking is to develop those schemes of thought in ways that prove interesting and useful to other people. And that's why you see you're kind of hostile to this aggregation element that you you describe. There's a section called a pol uh, I think it's called politics is a shell game, uh, where you but you seem very hostile to an equilibrium like a number, um, whether it's an interest rate or some sort of average, and how that's supposed to describe the society where actually that emerges from the kind of behavior you were talking about, every individual choice and you have it graphed in the book as like no as nodes and people making decisions. But you might emer an average might emerge from that. But if you look at the average, you're missing something is sort of the way you put it. As you always can construct averages, take any set of numbers, you can find an average for that. The that point in the book was an argument about uh, the relation between what we call macroeconomics and microeconomics, that most macroeconomic economists reason in terms of one kind of aggregate variable acting on another. And so you might say that an increase in education in a society increases economic growth perhaps, might be one possibility. I don't object to that as a statistical observation. But what I would say is that takes attention away from where the action really is. That is, if you really – like if you believe – go back to these – to change the example, go back to these macro stimulus kinds of notions. Suppose you say, well, it would be beneficial to spend $100 billion, the government to do that. Or make it a trillion. <laughs> make it more interesting. <laughs> might have some real money at some point. Yeah. A trillion here, a trillion be, there. Yeah. Be beneficial to spend a trillion. Well, you're, if you articulate that belief, if you believe the macro story, that would say, well, you don't care. You shouldn't care who spends it. Uh, you, you propose it and let someone else say how to spend it because what that model says and what matters is getting the spending up. Where I think no one, of course, would do that. And the fact they wouldn't says that what's important is the underneath kind of patterns of spending. You go back to this example I mentioned a moment ago about uh, uh, growth in education. Well, does it matter what kinds of programs, educational programs are supported? 
does it matter what kinds of educational organizations receive the support? Does it matter who it is that makes those decisions, whether it be public school bureaucrats or, or parents? And if you think those things are important, those are ignored by the macro kinds of formulations, but yet I think it's those things that are important. And what I mean by then a policy is a shell game is that that's to the extent that the debate takes place on the level of these aggregate kinds of variables. It loses sight of what it is that's really important in, in generating the kinds of things we really should be looking at. This idea of government as outside of the market and not bound by the kind of messiness of the market is pretty pervasive. I mean, you've got so you've got this kind of sophisticated academic version of it that you mentioned of seeing the government as the the mechanic working on the engine, but you also see it more at the folk level. Whenever you know, whenever something bad happens and there's the response, there ought to be a law. This idea that, that you know we've we've identified some problem, we can just kind of say that government should fix it, and then government will fix it. Um, so, can you give an example of how thinking about government economically, of applying economic thinking and analysis to government, might lead us to conclusions or an understanding that runs against what we might expect from this government as external and as a kind of perfect actor, like what this this might applying this might look like in practice. Well, first of all, I think one of the uh, concerns I've had and interest I had in not just writing this book but some of the uh, preceding ones is a recognition that we all operate with certain kinds of thought patterns in our head. And those thought patterns go a long way towards framing the way we think about things and that influences the conclusions we reach. And I think the image of, of politics as a, as a source of mechanics who fix what goes wrong in the private market is an image that has been cultivated for a long time. It's an image that's supported by the predominance of economic theory. The theory of economic equilibrium very much supports that image. And what I've been trying to do and will be doing for quite some time is to try to set forth and develop some of the uh, intellectual tools that, ex that carries forward this alternative ecological kind of image where uh, there are many people, for instance, um, on this point. You know, Adam Smith long ago made this famous image about a, a chessboard and how uh, so many politicians look upon the chessboard and think they can rearrange it. Uh, and that, that, again, that fits with the image of equilibrium theory. You look at a chessboard and you, you look over at it and you say, oh, Black's position is hopeless, so let's move three of the paces around and make it an even game again. Uh, but what happens if those pieces have minds of their own, and so they can talk back? Like if if they if if the chessboard image was accurate, uh, I think the uh, use of so-called illegal drugs would have vanished ages ago because people have minds of their own. And just because some political officials say that they're going to uh, harass and arrest people if they catch using them isn't going to stop it. It's going to change the channels of commerce that they pursue. And, and it's that kind of idea that uh, I'm trying to incorporate into this ecological motif and saying then that uh, good societies aren't simple matters of a set of politically designated officials uh, re keeping a machine repaired, but it's a much more of a self-governing kind of interactive uh, process that we have to tend to and think about. And you know, I, I think there's much, much work that really remains to be done truly in understanding how these self-governing social processes well, work. Well, maybe that's a really good example on Aaron's question about 
uh, illegal drugs. And I mean, this seems to be an entanglement that the way of thinking about how to uh, look at markets for illegal drugs is not to think about that the government comes along and makes drugs illegal by just waving a magic wand and therefore – I mean they're, they're – or makes them disappear. I mean they're made illegal but they makes them disappear by making them illegal. They, all they do is change the interaction between certain entities under certain conditions and, and prefer some people over other people. I mean that's oh, something you do really good in the book is you, you do a good job being, of being like if you're in a legal regime, you might be a good businessman because you are – Good at promoting your product, but if it becomes illegal, then different people are better at selling it, and that's the entanglement, the the, the enforcement mechanism of the government with the market mechanism of the drugs. It just it just changes it. It doesn't make anything happen. That's the honest way to do political economy. Is that accurate? Would you say? Yes, I would. I think it's you go back to square one. What we, have, oh, what we observe are people. People have connections and relationships with other people. Uh, some of those people go into political activities, some into commercial activities. They all occupy the same kind of society and the – I think questions become one of what principles might govern the relationships among the members of society. If you go back – it was in the late 19th century, there was a British jurist named Henry Mann, Maine, I'm sorry, Henry Maine, confusing him with Henry Manny. <laughs> it, goes, it goes back to Henry Maine. Ancient law. Ancient law. 1861. It's a great 1861, book. 1861. <laughs> and one of the formulations he had in there was the claim that the, to date, the, the character of what he called progressive societies was a movement from relationships based on status to relationships based on contract. Now, uh, towards the end of his life, even he was musing a bit about whether that was reversing. Uh, but if you look now, uh, that I think what we we found increasingly the, throughout the progressivist period actually has been a resurgence of relationships based on status or feudal type of relationships. I think that's a uh, we're finding a, an assertion perhaps of a new kind of feudalism uh, growing as, as against a society grounded fundamentally in, in liberty. And I think if you want to try to fight or counteract that, one of the challenges to understand the sources by which a free society might end up refutilizing, which I think has been happening. If you look at the kinds of relationships where uh, status based on age, race, gender, whatever, creates certain patterns of rights and obligations and duties outside of what do people do through private ordering, where there with freedom of association and private ordering, you would again find a rich variety of kinds of social formations, but they would be generated uh, through people's uses of their freedom to find associations that they regard as, as beneficial. And I happen to think my, the normative side of me happens to think that's a desirable quality of a society rather than, I don't know, and you saw Downton Abbey or those related things. But uh, sure, it was far better to be born upstairs than to be in a downstairs occupation. But on the whole, I think that's a scheme of life that we should be thankful to have left behind. If the lesson from thinking – from applying economic thinking and recognizing the economics in government action is that either it's going to – the government intervening is going to not have a desired effect because people are simply going to route around it. They're going to figure out alternate ways to do what they were already doing that might be slightly more expensive or less efficient, but they're still going to do it just like – so like drugs, people are still taking them and still buying and selling them. Um, or it's going to – and or it's going to screw things up um, because it's going to create these different sets of rights and obligations that – are incompatible with liberty or are going to make us worse off or whatever else, then does that mean that there – what does that say about the role of the state? Does Should there be no 
government intervention then? Is that the lesson of thinking economically about the state or is there still a role for it in intervening in the economy? We just need to do a smarter job of it. About that, I'd say two things. One is I would say is there's probably nothing that can't be handled through private ordering. So I think in that respect, I would qualify myself as in principle a philosophical anarchist in that respect in that uh, uh, take any kind of allegation about public goods, externality and so forth. Every such allegation implies a situation where there are gains from trade, from working out a way of avoiding that situation. Now, how do you work that out? It might be difficult. It might be costly. Uh, but still, as a starting point, that kind of situation implies gains from trade. And if so, that would suggest that, uh, you know, for instance, this was, goes back to a long ago article that Ronald Coase wrote about lighthouses that the standard public goods claim is you can't get lighthouses provided. And uh, Coase went and looked and there were all kinds of instances of lighthouses provided through uh, private uh, contracting. And you, uh, a similar claim was once upon a time made about, well, bees buzz around and pollinate crops and you can't uh, you won't get enough bee pollination, but Stephen Chung wrote a beautiful piece explaining that exactly how beekeepers uh, formed contracts with uh, both apple growers, clover field owners, and so forth, and developed a, a nice set of contracts that led to honey being produced, apples being pollinated, and uh, human ingenuity is is wonderfully creative, but. There's another uh, side to, I think, human nature as well, which is the ability to uh, convince oneself if, if someone in the losing end of the deal can, can easily convince him or herself that uh, he shouldn't have lost. And so if you have five people in undertaking different commercial investments, Two are successful, three are not, and so those three liquidate. They may just, okay, well, I've liquidated my business. Now I either go work for someone else or I develop a new business. That's one strategy. Another kind of strategy is to sign up with some regulatory agency, some politician, to get a grant program for new enterprises by people whose previous enterprises went other. Or alternatively, as often the case of many of the actions filed, whether it be for a, uh, a Federal Trade Commission, a Justice Department, and so forth, are actions that are filed by uh, people claiming unfair, they have lost unfairly by uh, actions of successful competitors. And so, you know, that uh, is also a natural kind of feature of of, of human action. And so when you think about what government might be needed for, you should be thinking about that people will game the system like that? Is that well, at the if, very least? If, if you're going to want to develop a, an explanation, to give an explanatory account of what we observe going on in the world around us, that means we have to read social life not through some kind of rose-colored glasses about uh, liberalism, private property, and so forth, but try to read them through what I would call realistic uh, glasses. That, uh, and if so, I think one of the challenges, uh, I cite this in the book, that at the time of the American Constitutional Convention, uh, the story goes that a woman asked Benjamin Franklin on leaving what kind of a government the convention have established and Franklin is reported to have responded, a republic, if you can keep it. Now that, sh that shows a couple of things about Franklin's thinking, I believe. One is he thought in evolutionary or developmental terms. It says you have it today. It doesn't mean you're going to keep it. That's to be worked out. And in many respects, uh, we have moved 
in more in a feudal like direction compared to what we uh, had then. It doesn't mean that feudal life is nasty, brutish, and short. It can be decently well. You, you, you uh, people downstairs in Downton Abbey all got to sit down and have supper and so on and so forth. Uh, but it's not a life where you're free to aspire to something beyond your status. And I think that ability to aspire to something, to live, to look forward to something, to live for something, I think is an important uh, feature that liberal types of orders bring out more fully than other types of orders. But there still brings you back to the explanatory issue of what are the problems that liberal kinds of orders then face internally that might operate to, to undermine them or, or at least to move them in non-liberal directions. Well, if we're going to – if we're going to get away from equilibrium, um, would it be accurate to say you're, a, you're against equilibrium? I mean, I mean it's it, – I don't know. It's a weird thing to be against but you're against it in misuse of equilibrium. Would that be a better way of putting it? Mis, misuse, not against. See, I think equilibrium is a perfectly good notion to apply to individual action. It means because every one of us in any of our actions, here we are right now. We think of something we want to do over the coming year. That means that we have some belief or some notion about how our actions are going to play out. And so that you might say is kind of an equilibrium notion that uh, what I object to is that – equilibrium notion being extended to an entire society because that gets you from a – moves you away from a pedestrian crowd into a, a marching band. And I think in the pedestrian crowd, each individual has – or groups of individuals have particular destinations they're heading to leaving the stadium. And – but there is no common uh, destination. And the important thing there is the ability of people to work that all out for themselves. And so I want to – see, I want to have a scheme of thought that allows the generation from inside a society of new products, new ideas, continual change. And so to have that I think means that – one person's plans two years from now might be challenged because someone else has developed a new product that's going to take away business. And you know, I think it, that means that the picture of a free society you're going to have is going to be one of, of commotion, of fluidity, which in turn means that people need to develop various kinds of measures for on the one hand, taking advantage of that fluidity, but also to some extent protecting themselves like insurance. Uh, but that doesn't mean it has to be public provided social insurance and so forth. And so, so it seems that in that sense of equilibrium that there, I see your book is sort of doing three, three things. The steps are to take the aggregation element and, and – blow it up, understand it's detailed, it's open it up and get inside and understand it's a bunch of people together for government and for the market. They're actually kind of thinking like CSI, and, you know, enhance, enhance, enhance and you figure out that the, the equilibrium point is actually or the interest rate is just a bunch of individual decisions but also within government. The government is not, not a single thing and the market is not a single thing. And then also to realize that they're not totally separate. So, there, so there's a bunch of integrated parts uh, behaving in a creative systems kind of way that when the way you use in government and in the market and they're not totally separate. They're actually intermixed or they're entangled and, if, and it's sort of you kind of plead to the end like if you're going to do honest political economy, you need to realize these basic points. Would that, would that be an accurate characterization? Of no, it's certainly in a characterization that I would accept and, and would embrace. I think it's – I would also, though, speaking of these separate systems or subsystems, I would say there's one system. It's the society in which we live, and that society, if you look at it, then is 
uh, composed of various kinds of, of subsystems of businesses, governments, um, that uh, there are many points of commonality between political enterprises and uh, market enterprises. One of the things I wanted to get across in that book is that so much thinking runs in terms of government construed as a unitary enterprise, a uh, the state, a, a, a state, a, a single, all embodied in a head person who makes choices and moves things around. And what I have been uh, working, trying to work out, is the idea that well, government is government. Use the plural governments. We have a system of governments which are kinds of orders. In fact, Gordon Tullock, uh, in The Politics of Bureaucracy, once coined the term bureaucratic free enterprise. <laughs> and what he meant by bureaucratic free enterprise is that no one really controlled big modern bureaus. There are all kinds of fiefdoms within a bureau of different kinds of agents and sub-agencies uh, pursuing their desires, their interests. And so it was a you know, Tulloch didn't use the term, but I think Tulloch would have agreed that uh, it was the bureaucracy was a very peculiar set of firms or, or enterprises, and that's what I'm trying to get across is that it's peculiar. But being peculiar, I think, means that within some of these ideas about networks, is these things can morph. You might say, if you have a relatively small number of these peculiar enterprises within a large sea of private enterprises. That's going to be – that kind of a system is going to have different properties than one if you have a large number of politically based enterprises, uh, perhaps more or less on par with the market-based enterprises. That's why, for instance, you take things like the uh, uh, recession or so-called of 2008. Well, you, know, you don't have any such thing as privately ordered credit markets anymore. In a, Privately ordered credit market, uh, someone wants to get a loan, someone has the capital to make a loan, they can work out a deal. If the lender doesn't want to lend, the, the borrower can come back with a promise of higher interest, better collateral. But the total credit market is simply the product of the various efforts of people to make deals. But now with various kinds of, of regulations and so forth that uh, – we have various kinds of rules that uh, lenders have to have that display portfolios that show the right kinds of distributions in terms of age, gender, geography, race, and so on and so forth. And which, if you think through that, means that there are going to be some loans made in particular cases that knowingly in, under private ordering wouldn't have been made and would have been thought to be bad business. And other loans that might have been thought to be good business under private ordering won't be made under public ordering because they're squeezed out. And so what that suggests to me is you're going to end up with a system that's going to have built in a greater amount of built-in volatility than it otherwise uh, would have had. But that uh, – And that's an I, entangled that's enterprise. That's an entanglement kind of – and the idea of entanglement, I mean, I, I don't believe in – really borrowing directly from the natural sciences, but uh, there is this notion of, of quantum in, entanglement that you can't locate the position of one particle without making reference to some other particle. And that's as close as I come to an analogy, but what I mean by entanglement is, if you look at textbooks on economics, theory of the firm, it says, well, a firm looks at its, its adjusts its inputs and its prices to form a production strategy to maximize its profit or its wealth. But if you look at it the substantive matter, that firms, especially large ones, are going – part of their doing business is going to involve uh, political grants, political exceptions and so forth. And that's why uh, the, the big location for trade associations now has shifted from New York to Washington and why so many chief executives now travel here on business on a, on a regular basis. It's not because there's any – not because of inputs as we understand them normally are produced here, but yet important inputs are. And that's what I mean by entanglement. At the same time, 
that uh, politicians also crave support from businesses in, in various ways that can provide things. And so that's what I mean by uh, – entanglement has always been with us. I cite a book by uh, – he's deceased now, but a wonderful economic historian, Jonathan Hughes, called The Governmental Habit. And Hughes looked at uh, economic controls in colonial America and they were still there just at a, at a much smaller scale than the way, what they are now. And so that's why I think entanglement will always be with it. I think it's part of human nature, so to speak. But I think, and what I wanted to try to explain here, is that entanglement can't be eliminated. It's part of human nature. That at the same time, it can become so densely entangled where the values of the political infuse themselves into the values of the market, the values of the market infuse themselves into the political. There's a wonderful book. I'm I've been, exp I've been suggesting too many books, I guess, in this <laughs> interview, but that's what an academic does. <laughs> it's a wonderful book by a woman, Jane Jacobs. She too is deceased now, but she had a book called Systems of Survival. And what she laid out, and I think it's wonderful, is that a well-working society requires an interaction between two types of moral syndromes, which she called a commercial syndrome and a guardian syndrome. She also coined the term monstrous moral hybrids to refer to what happens when uh, commercial people get involved in politics and guardian people get in, involved in markets. And you know, I, I think in a way what uh, this book tries to do is to lay out in, in an economic uh, theoretic manner a kind of a, lo a logic that does two things. It uh, starts with Ben Franklin's intuition about a republic if you can keep it with the observation that, well, we haven't done all that well in keeping it. And Jane Jacobs and the monstrous moral hybrids for, through the commingling of the commercial and guardian syndromes has much of value. And what I try to do in this book is to lay out how starting from a basically strongly liberal free market anti-feudal orientation, uh, you can involve in more of a new kind of uh, 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 feudalism. So I'm really curious how what you said just now seems like it might be a response to one of the more common criticisms of markets that we hear from our friends on the political left. Um, or a way that they're maybe mistaken in how they approach thinking about government and markets. Um, and so going back to the – when you said that if, if we had a purely private system of providing loans, like there are some loans that are being made under the current intermingled system that wouldn't have been made if we had purely private actors and there are other loans that would have been made if we had private actors. And a lot of people on the left would say, well, yeah, that's the whole point. Right, is that the the interests of the private actors? Um, sometimes the things that private actors do in a market help people. Um, sometimes they don't. But that their goal is not to help people. Their goal is their bottom line is to compete better with a, other firms. Um, and so, if it happens that providing the loans providing good loans that help people align with that, then that's what happens. And if not, and so what we need is the state to come in and say, look, there are people who are deserving of loans or there are loans that shouldn't happen regardless of profit motives. And so we're going to step in and fix things because we are – the difference between according to the people on the left, the market is that the market is individual pr pursuing their private interest and the state is this more unified thing that's pursuing the public good. And so you need to counterbalance the one with the other. Um, but as you had mentioned like that we don't – we're not talking about the government. We're talking about governments um, and that you said bureaucracies are these peculiar firms. And so my question is does that mean then that this critique of markets which is namely that competition – there's too much competition and the competition can be a bad thing also can apply to the state in that there's competition between bureaucracies. Do they compete in ways 
similar to or at least analogous to the way that firms compete in the market? There certainly is an, an analogy in competition. I think the analogy goes back to individuals. All people uh, form their various kinds of plans and schemes, some on a small scale. Some people just want to be a, a good uh, husband, good parent and uh, do their job well uh, through their days. Others have dreams of big industrial organ enterprises or political careers. But I would say that there's a problem that is deeply woven into our language that makes an opposition between state and market. So either you're involved in enterprise, commercial, buying and selling, or you're involved in, in political activity. And that kind of dichotomy uh, is a scheme of thought that takes all kinds of normal human sentiments and values out of commercial activity and sweeps them into the political. Whereas if you ask how do societies really operate, that there, yeah, there are uh, profit-seeking enterprises. Also what we find uh, is a whole history of very successful entrepreneurs and enterprises doing things like endowing foundations, establishing various kinds of eleemosserary enterprises and activities that I think in large, to a large extent represents – well, I don't want to give motivational accounts. That's not my business. But there are many kinds of motives that might lead someone. Some of them might want to just endow monuments to their own perpetuation. But I think many of them also feel a kind of a gratitude, especially perhaps – uh, people who came up on their own bootstraps, so to speak, who uh, after they've had s some success in business often like to try to help others, that uh, the state is by no means the place where you find concerns for people who seem to be misfortunate, unfortunate, and so forth, that this is also a quality that you find a, a lot of, of, of people sharing those beliefs and that's historically has been one of the uh, uh, uses of, of wealth has, has been, uh, you know, sure, you, it's easy enough to find these instances of, I don't know, hate to cast aspersions, but like the Paris Hiltons of the world who uh, just seem to just dissipate their wealth but you also find uh, huge many others who are involved in in trying to uh, press beliefs, causes, uh, their visions of good societies and so forth. And so I think uh, we've underestimated the social value of the creation of wealth and the work that wealthy people can do. And I would also, when I'm on this topic, register the objection, not to you, I mean, but the <laughs> objection out there that says, well, people who want to keep their wealth to, for their purposes are somehow, what's the word, stingy, uh, selfish. W selfish, yeah, that kind of thing. But what could be more selfish than a politician, political candidates saying, I want your wealth to do with it as I choose when I haven't made it? And, mm -hmm. and to use that to achieve political power. To yeah. use the – because that's the other part of your – like not only have we underestimated the social value and charity and elements of the market, we seem to have overestimated the people in government that they're just – they're people who have com – their competitive ex advantages speaking to people and promising to give – someone else's money to someone else and getting power because of that. So, th so they're not great people either but this is where they want to be. So when we're comparing the two, we're just talking about two flawed systems that we need to just compare honestly. Yeah, we should never forget that politics is fundamentally about the acquisition of power. Now all politicians say, I want power because I want to do good. But how many politicians have you sir heard say, I want power to do bad? I mean even Adolf Hitler said he was going to make the world a better place. Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, all these butchers all 
said they were going to do good with their power. That's, again, what we should expect. But uh, I think our historical experiences show us that sometimes, yeah, sometimes power will, will be used for benefit, but mostly not. I just happen to think that power won't ever go away. It's, it's inherent in the human drama. And what we should be engaged in is trying to work out what kinds of arrangements which power can do less, less harm than other arrangements. Thanks for listening. If you enjoy Free Thoughts, please take a moment to rate us on iTunes. Free Thoughts is produced by Mark McDaniel and Evan Banks. To learn more about libertarianism, visit us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.